Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for almost nine years and have two beautiful kids. Yes, we do. And we have received recently a lot of people asking if we had heard of or if we would review a show, it's on Discovery Plus, yep. called Prisoner of the Prophet. And so that is what we're doing today. We're going to, we had a chance to watch the first episode of that and uh, very interesting uh, show that we wanted to respond to. Yeah, this is going to be a really good, for those of you who are like new to our channel or haven't heard all of Sam's stories up to this point, first, like and subscribe. Second, um, this gives a really good overview of a lot of information that we've covered bits and pieces and lots of videos but this first episode gives a really good overview, I think. So yeah. we're gonna to touch on a lot of topics that some you may have already heard us talk about, some maybe you haven't, but it gives a really good overview of the FLDS, I think, and a lot of the problems within the FLDS, just yes. in this first episode. So we are excited to dig in, also heartbroken as we hear what happened to Brielle. Um, and this follows mostly her story, it's her sharing her experiences um, as a 65th wife, of Warren Jeffs. Of Warren Jeffs, yeah. So she was right in the middle of it all. She mm -hmm. unfortunately had to experience all of the, or well, most of, if not all of the other things that you hear other women talk about that were closely related or married to the prophet Warren Jeffs. And so, yeah, it's, it's like Melissa said, it's kind of a great overview of a lot of the things we've talked about. Uh, and also a couple snippets of, of new information as well along the way. Yeah, it talks a lot about, it kind of gives a little bit of history of Warren Jeffs for so. For those of you who aren't aware, um, Rulin Jeffs, his father was the prophet, and as Rulin was getting more sick um, in his older years, Warren was kind of placing himself at his father's side. Warren is not the oldest um, out of not all even, his not brothers. Not even close. Not no. even close, but he positioned himself in a way he ended up becoming the principal of the school up in Alta, and he positioned himself in favor with his father to where he was so used to being right there that when his father passed away, Warren just inserted himself and said that he received revelation, like he was supposed to be prophet. And people went with it because at that point he had already spoken as his father and for his father for so long. Right, and, and we all, it was pretty easy for us to believe him actually because we looked up at we looked up to him. We thought that he was this amazing man that was also receiving revelation from God because his father was then sick and becoming more and more sick and he would tell us that he was receiving revelation through his father at the time uh, that was coming from God and then he, it was pretty easy for us to just transition and say, okay, yeah, no, now he's the next prophet, at least for us young people that didn't know any better. Yeah, I thought it was Interesting, Brielle shares the experience of her older sister being married to Rulin Jeffs. Mm -hmm. And that also happened with Sam's sister. Yep. And it seemed, it was like eerily similar in the circumstances because as Rulin was getting older, Warren was encouraging Rulin to continue to get married to these young, young girls. And it was really weird, like why, when he already had like so, so, so many wives, we're talking like, mm -hmm. how many wives did he end up having? Like 50, 60, like a lot of wives. Are you talking about Rulin? Or yeah, Rulin. Rulin, which is Warren's father. Yes, he, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, my sister was his 60th. Okay, so, so many wives. So why, when you are on oxygen, you're in your, like almost 80 years old, and you're having all these health struggles, Warren is pushing for him to marry 18 year old girls. He married Brielle. Uh, sorry, not Brielle, Brielle's sister, um, at, I think she was only 18, yep, Brielle's sister was 18, mm -hmm. and he was over 80 when it happened. How old was your sister when it happened? She would have been in her uh, teens as well. I, I want, for some reason, 19 rings a bell, around the age of 19. So, and, and Rulin was marrying underage women uh, to other men, and he was... I, I guess I can't say for him specifically, but I believe I've heard stories that he was also married to underage women as well, but it was mostly Warren's doing, and it was mostly Warren himself that was actually marrying off these really young women under the age of 18. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, yeah, she was talking about 
her family's experience and feeling like it's an honor to marry the prophet, mm. right? And that it was supposed to be this huge honor and the family was happy and proud. And they kind of go into, and I think there was a, was a psychologist or sociologist in this documentary that goes into the fact that like the women knew there wasn't really an option. You couldn't say no to marrying the prophet. And the whole family was thinking that was an honor, and your family thought that as well for your sister, right? Oh, 100%. I very vividly remember the day that Rulin Jeffs pulled up in his town car to pick up my sister, and she went and got in and drove away with him, and, and we all assumed that it was the most amazing thing that could possibly happen to our family. And, and I believe this is briefly mentioned in this show as well uh, by Brielle, but all of these women put on such a good disguise of happiness and joy and well, keeping sweet, right? And so we all assumed they were happy. And, and now, finally, women are coming out and telling their side of the story. And oh my goodness, some of the stuff that went on was just horrific. But at the time, and you know, being someone in the community and believing all the things that, was, that were being told to me by these leaders, I would have never in a million years assumed that the women were not happy. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know the term keep sweet, um, keep sweet is just meaning to always have a smile on your face, always have a positive attitude, um, complete and total obedience, and putting on that brave face at all times. The women were told that um, in this show particularly, they shared a lot of like quotes from Warren telling women to keep sweet, how important it is to be submissive to their husbands, and that it's their job as women to just be completely meek and mild and pretend to be happy at all times. And that's really the only way that you can make in these um, polygamous circumstances. It's the only way to really have that many wives is to have complete control, have the man be in complete control and have the women be told they need to be completely submissive and, ob and obedient. Um, there's, I don't think there's any other way to make a relationship like that actually work. <laughs> no. Without I that mean, patriarchy. No. I mean, I can't not imagine, that seen. not that I could imagine, but it's, it's interesting because Warren would also get angry at these women if they didn't show him affection, affection and didn't want to be with him. And, you know, and so he would actually put them on the spot and embarrass them in front of the other family members or the other wives if they weren't submissive to him and did what, uh, or even if they weren't, they had to pretend that they were attracted to him. Yeah, and he did that specifically to Brielle, but before we get into what is like the marriage was like with her, um, when she had just barely turned 18 years old, and they go into a little bit of like the grooming process, the fact that when her sister was getting married to Rulin, she, you know, she went and shook Warren's hands and people like made comments about the way that he looked at her, right? And that was at 14 years old. And I've heard from other people who lived out there that they knew specifically when they were going to be groomed or or were going to be Warren Jeff's future wives from a very young age, which is really disturbing that he kind of would like pick them out or favor them or specifically like look at them certain ways, um, which is just super hard to watch. But when she was 18, her father came into the kitchen and said, we're going on a drive. And basically, you know, and to hear that her father was crying for this, like oh, broke my heart. Because, again, these men don't really have a choice either. Because at this point, um, when she had married Warren, Warren was the prophet. Rulin had passed away. And Warren had taken most of Rulin's wives as his own. Um, a lot of the younger wives <laughs> that he made sure his father had, he made sure that then they were in line to become his wives. And for those of you, you may be curious, since we were just talking about my sister, Warren did not marry my sister after his father passed away. Uh, she was remarried to one of Warren's older brothers. So, still stayed within the family, and uh, it's unfortunate that the, the women just, they were tossed around and reassigned and repositioned. And it, uh, it was just a, a big mess. Yeah, all in the name of revelation from God, all the marriages are completely arranged. Um, the men and women don't get to decide who they're going to marry. It is all up to the prophet and his revelation as to who they're going to marry. So... Um, hence the reason why the prophets end up with, uh, what did Warren end up with? 87 wives. It's interesting that, you know, most men are hoping for three mm -hmm. so they can reach the highest degree of glory and get back to God. 
and yet the profits, for some reason, need 87, including underage ones. In and order because of to... because of them needing 87 wives, them meaning Warren, that is one of the reasons so many of the men were forced out or kicked out or uh, sent away. They, they use a lot of different terms, uh, but they would all say that it was because they sinned and then they were forced out to go somewhere who knows where to repent. And some of these men were never invited back uh, to this day. And so it seems that he was getting rid of some of the men so that, you know, there weren't so many men around the community and he could have more women to himself. That's, that's what, I mean, if you just look at it from the outside looking in, that's what it seemed like. Yeah. So she was 18, so she got driven. Her, her father was, she said, visibly like crying and um, upset. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they don't really have a choice either. Um, if he did try to say like that he wasn't going to give his daughter up to the prophet, then he could have been kicked out of the community, lost all his wives, his family, his children, his property, everything. Yeah. Um, anyway, so he took her to Ruland's house, actually, and, or, yeah, Ruland's house at that time, and um, there she met Warren. And this part was so disturbing because even under the guise of, we know that Warren um, wasn't moral in any way, right? But the way that they're taught out there is like they're not allowed to look at boys, they're not allowed to touch boys, um, they're not taught anything, any kind of sexual education, nothing like that. And before the marriage even occurred, he said like, come sit on my lap, and he was physically like touching her inappropriately before the ceremony even happened. So the amount of like emotional and physical abuse and trauma that that is, is like even more heightened because of the way that they're taught oh, yeah. their entire lives. So the fact that he like, the way that he would manipulate and abuse even outside of like the religion's realm, right? Because within the religion, underage marriage isn't a big deal. Um, obviously like marital relations, not a big deal. But the way that he even went beyond the the craziness of the religion's expectations was like sickening. Yeah, and he would always twist it in a way that made it seem that it was the Lord's will, that it was God's will that they that he was marrying all of these women. He would ask questions like, "Have you received revelation on who you should marry?" Right, like as as this as she was sitting on his lap. And, and he was touching her, you know, I don't know what touching her means. I mean, that, that's just what she said. But then after that, he asks, Did you, have you received revelation from God on who you should marry? Well, it's pretty obvious what the answer she's supposed to say, right? It's pretty obvious what he's getting at. And for fear of dis, uh, disappointing him, she agreed, it sounds like, that, yeah, uh, she, he had received revelation or, or some type of inspiration that he was the one she was supposed to marry. So it, he, he tricked him into just thinking that uh, it was actually a revelation that they received, not just him. Yeah, definitely manipulation on, like, every single level mm -hmm. um, to have these women. Yeah. Um, just a couple weeks after she got married to him, she was separated from her family completely and got moved to Texas. Yeah. Um, to El Dorado and if you've seen our other videos and the document the documentary Keep Street Pray and Obey there are a lot more details about everything that happened in Texas but particularly she talks about some of these heavenly sessions which were basically orgies <laughs> that yeah. um, he that he was having these women participate in and just watch the show for details on that. We're not going to go into the details. But she had been under the impression, and I think sometimes even outsiders wonder about this. I know growing up LDS, like, you hope that if an 80-year-old man is marrying a 14-year-old girl, like, oh, maybe he's not having sexual relations with her. <laughs> and when she said when she saw these underage, like her underage cousin in that group of the elite women that were doing and performing these acts um that's when it like hit her that these underage girls were having those things happen to them as well yeah and it was just really sad like to hear her talk about the fact that like none of these women were standing up and saying that that was wrong because 
they were so conditioned to be obedient. Yeah, and because these women, these older, not old, but older women weren't saying anything or standing up against it, the younger ones, they were, they were in a way, not because they wanted to, but they were in a way conditioning these young 14-year-old girls. That, that it's it, all okay. That it's all okay. This is the way it's supposed to be because they weren't saying anything about it. But they believed that Warren was talking and acting for God. And so if you believe that someone is actually a man of God and doing only what God wants him to do, then who are they, who is anyone to stand up against God and say, nope, hold on, you know, I'm not going to do this because, you know, all powerful God could smite someone and that's the end of it, right? Like that, that's the thoughts that they would have and that they were afraid to do anything uh, against what he's told them to do. Well, and they were told that like anytime they got to be with Warren Jeffs, it was they're getting to have these amazing spiritual experiences, right? They weren't called like sexual experiences. They're supposed to be these spiritual experiences heavenly. to help heavenly sessions and um, the manipulation of the words even to make them feel like somehow it was a spiritual thing and that they were receiving spiritual blessings for getting to be with Warren. It's just like another way that he just manipulated every single situation with every single woman. It was, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, she kind of goes through that and talks about a whole bunch of different, some of the interesting things that she was taught, you know, as a youth preparing her. But I would say towards the end, it started talking about the fact that, like, she's in Texas and these things are happening and she's being, like, publicly humiliated. She's having wives who are, like, tattletelling on her for not following the rules because they're jealous that he's giving her more attention because he wasn't getting the attention from her that he wanted. And so it was putting a target on her back as far as these other wives go. And of course they're all keeping sweet, but trying to gain favor with Warren. And there were a couple things that they kind of brought up like toward the end that was like at that point, Warren started grabbing all the assets from the church changed it to a charitable organization so, so that he would be in charge, he of, would everything. Be in charge of everything. He had a hundred million dollars in assets. Mm -hmm. He was able to cut off people completely from their family, their um, houses, their businesses, everything, which is another reason why he was able to get such young brides. And when, oh, sorry. Oh, and all of this stuff is happening clear back in Short Creek still. Oh yeah. And all of the physical grooming and the sexual abuse is all, not all, but mostly happening in Texas itself. And she said that he made it seem like all the wives were becoming an accomplice to underage sexual, sexual relations. Like mm -hmm. they were being tied to each other in a way that made it feel like if any of them said anything about any of it, that they were all going to be destroyed and their families could be destroyed and everything would be completely torn apart because at this point he'd just become in charge of everything. Just a complete <laughs> Yeah, he has he had so much power over not only the emotions of the people, but and still does, might I add, so much power over the emotions of the people, but also the physical property and bodies of the people. I mean he had complete power at this time, which is just it's crazy to think about. But most of these people, me included, we were born into this. We, he wasn't out there recruiting people and convincing them to come and join. We were born into this and believed in the prophets before him. And we just believed that he was the next prophet. And that some of these changes were happening because it was coming closer to the, to the second coming of Christ. That's what we were told. So we would look at all of these things that were happening that were different from the past and just looking at it as a, as a blessing because we are that much closer to being prepared for Christ's second coming. So it's just, I mean, and, and to think, I mean, I'm so grateful this never happened to me now. But man, when I was living out there in Short Creek, I would have loved the opportunity to be called out in the middle of the night, like some of these elite people and sent to Texas or sent to these other compounds to help build up the kingdom of God because we believe that was the most important thing on this earth. So I kind of felt like I was a, uh, I don't know, I was 
unprepared. I was a bad person because I was never called to go do these things. So, you know, when someone would get called in the middle of the night, man or woman, and said, hey, you've got to go, you've been called to this elite position in such and such place, it wasn't like they resisted. They were happy to go. They thought it was, way. Well, you know, this is amazing. I, I mean, some of us even thought that if we did go, we would actually meet Christ in person if we had that opportunity. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was ingrained in us so deeply. Yeah, on the note of you saying that like it was had happened with prophets before, there are multiple times in this documentary where they mention the fact that like they were told, and I um, know you were told as well from a very young age, like that the prophets before them had done these same things. That you know it was okay to marry underage brides because Joseph Smith married a fourteen-year-old. He married underage brides, and so if he could do it, then there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do it. And um, they also mentioned. The trust, when the trust was first started, the UEP, the United Effort Plan Trust, um, that was going to be starting to gather all of the deeds to all the houses and the property and have it all be within control of the church, they also did that because of the United Order or consecration that Joseph Smith tried to put into place. Now, Joseph Smith, he tried to do the love consecration, and it did not work, okay, right. because, yeah, because that's just not something that tends to work. It's not, it's not easy. It's you, not easy. Everyone has to be completely selfless in order for that to work. Yeah, and so, but again, there was the precedence of it before that they could look to these past prophet um, of Joseph Smith and say, well, if these things happened before and we want to continue the restoration that Joseph Smith had, then there's no reason why they shouldn't work for us now and um, why we shouldn't use him as an example. So watching them use those things as excuses to continue to get more power was also hard because you see where they're coming from and then growing up LDS obviously to see those type of things be um, used as manipulation tool for hurting people is yeah. like super hard. But it also kind of helps people from the outside looking in understand why they're falling for it, mm -hmm. why they're believing it because they're not just making stuff up. I mean, they are as well, but they're always also basing a lot of the stuff that they're doing on, hey, this is what the past prophets did. This is what it says in the scriptures. And they're, and they're trying to, and, and of course, you can read a passage of scripture and uh, 20 different people could interpret it 20 different ways, right? So yeah. that happens all the time as well. And, and that's what they're doing in some cases. Yeah. So the last thing that I want to touch on, because they touch on it a whole bunch of times in multiple places, and we probably should have described this a little bit sooner or given a definition, is they talk about what the word apostate means, oh. what uh, the word apostate means. And Warren Jeffs, so Sam's an apostate. Anybody who leaves, whoop, whoop. <laughs> who leaves the church is considered an apostate. Um, there's different terms for people who have never been a member of the church, of the FLDS church. Um, I would be considered a Gentile just meaning that I never even had the truth to begin with, even though I was raised LDS, which is like closely related. So you would think that like, maybe I could be considered, but they would not consider me. Um, I didn't ever have the fullness of the right. truth that the FLDS has. So I'm a Gentile. Sam is an apostate. And I had not heard this quote from Warren Jeffs before, but it kind of shed a little bit of light of why they're so scared to have connection uh, with people who leave. There's a reason why Sam is not allowed to talk to his family, why he's not allowed to have a relationship with his siblings, with his mother, with his father. Um, and Warren just had said, apostates are tools of the devil. And I was like, dang, that's a really good example of what they're being taught as to why they can't have connection. Because people ask us that all the time, like, oh, can you talk to your mom? Can you talk to your siblings? And the answer is no. And it's because they believe that when somebody's left, they're a tool for the devil. Yeah, and then that's one of the reasons we were so afraid to leave uh, when we lived out there is, you know, we were told these types of things, you know, that, so, that Satan would be in control of us if we left. And that's why we would be a tool of the devil, because we would be under his control. He would control our lives. We'd be on his ground. And, uh, and so we would look down upon the apostates as these awful people that we didn't want around, you know? And so after having those types of feelings towards other people that had left the church, it was not an easy decision to then become this awful apostate <laughs> when, you know, yeah. that's how we felt when we made the decision to move out originally. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, if you'd like to hear more of what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy, then please like and subscribe. And we will, over the next couple weeks, be covering, there's two more episodes of Brielle's story. Um, again, Prisoner of the Prophet from Discovery Plus. And we will review those in the upcoming weeks. Yes. Yeah, so thank you all for being here. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Talk to y'all soon.